Okay, so we're live. And we're live. And we're live. Can you hear us? Sound check. This is the first time we're doing sound check. It's the beginning. Do we have any people listening? Are there people on here yet? Two people. Two, three, oh, three oh, hundred. We're growing. We need you to tap on the hearts if you can hear us. Matt, talk. Can you hear me now? Can you I hear need me you to heart away. Hearts, hearts, hearts. 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 Look it up. Me? Nobody? Can't hear us? All right, we're just going to proceed as if they can hear us. I like it. Just kidding. So, um, this is the Social Happy Hour. It's a weekly broadcast every Tuesday at around 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time-ish. Depends. And uh, we host it here from the Gaslight in Philadelphia on Market Street. It is a delightful bar and restaurant that has great food, including chip and nuggets, which we already ate. That's uh, German for chicken nuggets. Very they good. come with a truffle dipping sauce and uh, barbecue sauce. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I come here because I love their old fashions, as does Matthew. And what we do is we have approximately an hour-long uh, Periscope broadcast. Sometimes it's 45 minutes yeah, to an hour. And we discuss two topics in the world of marketing and social media and technology and the future. Um, sometimes we touch on things outside of that, but that tends to be our thing. Um, and today with me, I have a very special guest. This is my BFF, my bromance, my very best friend, Matthew Angler. He's not just my friend, he also is a president of, wait, no, not the president. Well, I mean, in my head. In your head. So, uh, Matt, introduce yourself to all the nice people, and for all of you, uh, Alyssa is our producer, and she is back there running the show. Please give your questions along the way, but right now, hold, hold, hold your questions. Matthew Angler. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Angler, uh, BFF of one Jeff Gibbard, first and foremost. Uh, and number two, digital marketer for DuPont for our, prote our uh, protective technologies business unit. So, uh, managing a good bit of our major brands within DuPont, and a uh, pleasure to be here tonight, man. Thank you very much. And for those that don't know, DuPont is a French company. It's not a French company. <laughs> well, it's not a French company. It's a French name. French name. Whatever. They quarter the uh, And for, for those that don't know, the uh, division that you work for is. Is the uh, is the division that manages what? So there are three main brands within the protection technologies business. So Kevlar is one. You'll recognize Kevlar from Batman. Uh, the, yes, absolutely yes. But uh, so bulletproof vests, armored vehicles, life protection, that sort of thing. Uh, Nomex. So anytime you see a firefighter, their turnout here. Uh, a lot of times Nomex is in there, and we just a lot of flame resistance. Uh, and then Tyvek. Tyvek is kind of like our catch-all, it's everywhere. You'll see it in house wrap, we're in uh, medical and pharmaceutical packaging to keep things sterile. I think uh, I've seen Tyvek before on the outside, yeah, I mean, like it's the insulation. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So those are three of the major brands within the protection technologies business, and there's a lot of other sub-businesses with that, within that as well. All right, cool. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know me, tuning in for the first time to the Social Happy Hour, I am Jeff Gibbard. I'm the president of True Voice Media. We're a social business agency uh, located a mere few blocks from the Gaslight at 3rd and Arch in Old City, Philadelphia. And we design social strategies for any type of business that's looking to accomplish business results of some sort. Not trying to make you good at social media, but rather make you good at business with social as a technology. So today, what Matt and I have powwowed about and talked about is our two topics. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the two topics and then we're gonna start with the first one. The first topic is the role of the modern marketer. So what it means to be in marketing in 2015. That's topic one. Topic two, we're gonna move into marketing automation. So for some of you, you may not even know what the heck marketing automation is. Uh, what that world encompasses. Matt has a lot of experience with it. I dabble in it, uh, though my role is very different uh, than Matt's role. He is both strategic and hands-on, while mine is uh, generally just in the strategic department. We're gonna talk a little bit about marketing automation, how it helps businesses of all sizes, and we're gonna come at it from slightly different uh, perspectives, but to give you an education on, on what marketing automation is. But we're gonna start with modern marketing. That's today's topic. So. I'd say for, and, and just as a reminder for all of you out there watching, if you love us, if we say something amazing uh, or something you agree with or something you just want to give us a shout out and show your appreciation, please just tap on your screen as many times as you feel like to give us a bunch of hearts. Hearts mean a lot to us. We have very, very fragile egos. Matt, much, so, much more so than I. Yes. Uh, he, we don't want him crying by the end of the episode, so please make sure you give us some love. That's right. Uh, modern marketing. Yeah. So. You look back 10, 15 years, 20 years, something like that, and the role of a marketer looked very different. You go back even further, 
and it looks dramatically different. Right. Nowadays, as a marketer, depending upon the business you're in, you may have to manage direct mail. Right. You may have to manage uh, print, video, or, or television, radio. Right. You may have online uh, uh, marketing, such as uh, SEO, SEM, email marketing, marketing automation, social media, uh, uh, paid search, organic search, social ads. What's one to do anymore? And someone in your role where, and I think give everybody a little explanation of what your team looks like and the sort of right. projects you're working on, how do you manage all of these different things that a marketer needs to think about to reach their audience? So I think you hit the nail on the head when you're talking about like, kind of the expanded role of the marketer, right? And, and how many different avenues, how many different platforms there are. So let's look at marketing from kind of the beginning, right? It was all push. Yeah. I mean, you, talk, you think about marketing, it was all advertising, those big advertising firms. You think about the shows on AMC that really talked about, so I, there's one in particular, I think. Donald you, Draper. Exactly, right? That was all push. You know what I mean? It, was, it, it wasn't a lot of looking at the customer, looking at what their thoughts and needs were. It was like, we're a company, we're a brand, we've got a message, and we're going to push that as hard and often as we possibly could. 10, 15 years ago, then you started getting into more pull marketing, right? I mean, so that's where, okay, a little bit more thought to the customer, a little bit more thought of what are their needs, and, and understanding that it wasn't all about a push strategy, but really, what could we create that people would actually want to pull towards them? It's grown infinitely more complex now, in my opinion, where you have push, you have pull, and there are so many different avenues that you can go to do that. You mentioned direct mail, social media, email marketing, a search engine optimization. And to be able to manage all that takes someone who not only is, is capable from a strategic standpoint, but in my role, you talk about the projects that I'm working on, I think you gotta be a darn good project manager to work as a modern marketer this day and age as well because you are bringing together so many different parts of the company to make marketing happen. I, one of the things you and I were mentioning on the way over here was it's not just about marketing anymore but this convergence of both marketing and IT because as things are, there's no more a division between marketing and digital marketing. It's all becoming one. Yeah. And as things are becoming more online and technology is at the forefront of all of your marketing practices, it's this massively complex thing to manage across both marketing and information technology to make it work. Yeah, and, and God, you said so many things that just brought up thoughts to me. The role of the marketer, not only do you need to be a great project manager because you have all these different projects, right. number one, and not only do you need to be one, at least able to work with IT and work with the, the, the technologists in your firm, but you also have to somewhat be one to right. understand how these technologies fit. I'd say there's also an overlap between marketing and sales now. So now you have to think like a salesperson. So now marketing is overlapping with IT and with sales. And beyond that, to be a marketer in today's day and age, if we you know go back to your original point of it used to be push marketing, the data that you were collecting was very minimal. Yes. You know, maybe you went out and did some focus groups and you maybe pulled some percentages from that, but now we're looking at what's my click-through rate, what's my average converted click right. you have multi-channel funnels right. you know uh, you're dealing with what's the, uh, the uh, cost per acquisition across my different spending channels yeah. and are they assisting in one another so right. it's this infinitely comp so you need to be a statistician a technologist <laughs> a salesperson a marketer right. and not only that but you need to be a traditional marketer and a digital marketer and you still need to be social right. while at the same time being able to sit behind a spreadsheet and create a pivot table to make sense of it all it, is there any hope for marketing to be owned, but could, here's the thing. So we work with a lot of different companies, and one of the things that we found is we will sometimes be compared or competing against the the option of bringing someone in house. Yes. Now we have the resources of people that have a bunch of different skill sets and capabilities. Is there any one person that can come in and be all of that? So you're talking about what I think, what I call the modern dilemma of marketing, and that's what is the structure of your team? I mean, because that's the biggest question that I think most people are answering. We talked about the technology stack, right? It's all the different platforms that are working in unison to uh, put forth a brand experience. Or I, I would to say a, allegedly working oh, together. I mean, well, we're well, not so, there yet. So in an ideal world, right? Yes. So, and then so the question is, do I try to train, take for example, me as just one resource, do I try to train a Matt Engler to be an expert in each of these different technology platforms? Do I divide and conquer? Is that split amongst a couple different people? Is that managed by an out, outsourced vendor? Yep. Who is accountable? Is it marketing? Is it actually IT? Because they're working on mostly making sure that the back end is right and talking with all the different 
systems, whether it be CRM and Salesforce and that and that sort of thing, or or you know bringing SAP, etc. That is the question that I think a lot of managers, marketing managers, need to answer. And I I think there's companies that do it well, but I don't think that anyone really has like here is your best practice yeah. because it's so varied and so wide depending on are you B two C. Are you B2B? What, how do you segment your target audience? Yep. I mean, so that is the complexity that people are trying are to Are you a national out. brand or are you a local brand? Are right. you a big company, a small company, or a medium company? Is right. a big, small, or medium judged by revenue or by number of employees? How many people are accountable and customer facing? How many people are, so I, yeah, I would agree with you. I think there's a bazillion different variables and, uh, and different permutations of how this can play out. So there is probably no individual best practice. So it begs the question, where do you even start? So, you know, you as a marketer, you came in and they were like, okay, this guy seems pretty smart, seems like he right. can pick up just about anything. Right. Does it start with what's our need or does it start with what's the capability this person already has or is there something where they kind of meet in the middle? So it's a great question. I always say that you want to start with what's the need. I mean, because unless you've established, and one of the things that we've done at DuPont, I think, done a fairly good job of doing at the very beginning, is getting alignment with the, the market segment leader, right? So, so how it works at DuPont is that we have our digital marketing team, and that we call it, call it an integrated marketing team, right? And they, are, they oversee a couple different segments. So I have responsibility for about seven to eight different sub-business units within protection technologies. And so my role, first and foremost, is to get with those market leaders and really establish what is it at the end of the year or the end of three years or end of five years that you want. And that has to be regardless of what my capabilities are and what the capabilities of my team is right now because if we don't start there, how could you possibly know what we need to make as a change within the team? So if you align on that, which takes a lot of work, by the way, yeah. a lot of work and a lot of parsing out and a lot of different conversations to get to the truth of what is the actual outcome. Because the outcome isn't, well, we want so many Twitter followers, or we want... Uh, well, at least in a business that's cognizant of the fact that they're in business, not in the business of social media. Yeah, exactly, right. So, you know, what is that revenue goal? And then what does that look like? Like, if, you, if you're standing there in that revenue goal, how are you from a market share perspective? Um, what do you look like to your competitors? How are you perceived in the marketplace? And I think from there, you can start to work your way backwards with then designing the team around that that is going to be able to deliver on that outcome. Do you think that everybody in an organization nowadays is part of the marketing team? You have to be. And, and I think social has really played a role in that as well to tie it into so kind of what you're bringing to the table because one of the things that we're working on is almost everyone's got to be a content manager. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we, it is. It can't be just Matt who doesn't have necessarily the technical expertise in a highly regulated and highly technical industry that I work in. Yeah. That is coming up with the content that resonates. I have to work with technical marketing. I have to work with the engineers. So there is also a culture and mindset shift that marketing is really playing a big part in, with teaching them as you're going about your day to day. What sort of messaging can I come up with that resonates with who we're ultimately trying to sell to? So I think absolutely everyone's part of the marketing team. No, I love that. This just it completely inadvertently. You have hit on one of the, um, I don't want to call it the theories, but the frameworks that I generally bring when I'm talking to an organization. And that's that in order for any sort of marketing, and specifically social marketing, to work in an organization, three elements need to be well balanced. Right. Technology, culture, and process. And what you've just talked about here is that you have to have the right technology. You need to be right. able to the technology working with the IT department and making sure you have the right technology. You need to have the right process, meaning you start with the outcome and then you scale it back and figure out what's going to take to get from point A to point B. Right. And then you just hit on culture, that everybody needs to be on board with it and buying into it. Can an organization in your mind, I mean, you're working with a big organization, but put yourself in the mindset of a brand manager for a small brand, right. small or medium-sized company. Can you get by with any one of these legs of the table not, not being there or not being strong? So we'll take it each one by one, right? Basically challenge my theory. Yeah, well, saying. okay, so let's let's take technology. There are band-aids and probably workarounds that you can put in place, but you have made it infinitely harder on yourself. I mean, one of the things that we have worked on consistently over the past few years is not only what is our technology stack, right? What is the, the technology we need in place to achieve our outcomes, but then putting in the back end to make sure that all of these work together, which is no small task. Yeah. I mean, because otherwise, Depending on how large or small your team is, it can be really hard 
to go in and continuously manually pull these this data out and then develop the insights needed to then push that into the next step down in the technology yeah. stack for that to do its work, right? So I think probably technology would be the third, which might be a little counterintuitive to how a lot of people would approach it. I'm glad you said that, because I generally will say the same thing. No matter how good your technology is, without a culture that buys into it, without yes. the process to make it work, right. it's never going to work. Right. So then comes number two is process. Right? Yep. And, and again, that, that buys into how streamlined and efficient can you be. And that's something that you can continuously work on and refine and optimize over time. If you don't have the culture, and for when I think culture, I also think mindset. And you and I, we worked together before. It was a the company that was all about mindset. I think there was gold in Denver Hills, right? If you don't have the mindset and people on board for this, and we have had to do a lot of selling of this, and we'll get to marketing automation. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. had to do a lot of selling on the benefits of marketing automation, what it will do for their specific segment to get people on board to start to think this way. Because if not, we will naturally gravitate what our, towards our day-to-day -day job is. And unfortunately, this content management piece, like thinking about, oh, what can I produce that would resonate with the customer? People perceive that as, that is extra work that I have to do. I'm yeah. already overwhelmed, I'm already overloaded, our team isn't big enough. I mean, all the common, I think excuses is maybe too strong a word, but common issues, reasons. That, reasons that people provide for not wanting to do this sort of work. No, it makes perfect sense. So, I mean, I guess it, it naturally leads into this idea that the job of modern marketing has become much more difficult. And I would suggest that the number of channels and it's the explosion of these channels has what's made it so much more difficult. Yes. And the technology is continually chasing to make a solution right. for this explosion of channels. Absolutely. What I found is that no matter how good the technology is, and no matter how many tools come out, we then have just another responsibility of another tool to manage, or we have another we have another yeah, thing yeah, yeah. to so Absolutely. like just at the simplest level. In the beginning of social media, it was basically Twitter and Facebook for, for all intents and purposes, and maybe a little LinkedIn and YouTube. Yep. But that was like the number of platforms you had to worry about. Yep. Now you've got Instagram, you've got Vine, you've got Snapchat, you've got Pinterest, you've got, um, now you've got Lab.am, right. you've got Periscope, right. you've got, I mean, so, so many channels. And like, yeah, you can say this solves another problem, but at the same time it creates another problem. Absolutely. So, is there going to come a point in your mind where the role of marketing has grown so big that it grows out of control? Or is that just the fallacy of us chasing too many bright shiny things and not doing enough with the, with the channels that we have that are actually being affected? That is a fantastic question. Um, I'll, I'll provide it in, a, in, a, in an example. So I was, a couple weeks ago, I was down at one of our manufacturing plants and we were introducing this whole concept of marketing automation to a business unit. And we use uh, a platform, a software called Eloqua. Okay, yep. that's how we do marketing automation. So typically you hear Eloqua, you hear Marketo, the two yep. big names when it comes to that sort of thing. So I had about 45 minutes with this team to kind of say, okay, here's where we're going. Here's what we're gonna do. This is the platform we use. I maybe spent two slides on Eloqua itself and 10 slides on ultimately why this was not going to create more work for you. Got it. Because the, there is a fear and you think you, you hit the nail on the head that it's like this is the new flavor of the month. Yeah. Because there are so many different options, I think people go and jump from platform to platform, technology to technology, software to software, trying to find that. But how, how that actually gets noticed outside of marketing is, well, here they go again, you know, the, why should I even bother with this? But because you need so much buy-in across the organization, marketing can't work in its own little silo and vacuum anymore. I think the major decision is, these are the three to four that we're gonna use and we're gonna do them really well and we're gonna give it the proper amount of time to actually work and resource it how it needs to be so that in you know six months from now we're not going, well, that was a waste of money and throw yeah. it out the door. I, it, that, that I no, that makes question. perfect sense and I, and I think you hit the nail on the head for something that I consistently say which is uh, people often forget the, that the I in ROI is investment and what they're often looking for is a return but they forget that they actually, to get that return, sometimes they have to put out an investment in the, in the first place. Yes. You have to buy the technology, you have to set it up properly, you have to right. integrate it with your business processes, you need to provide the training, you need to make yeah. sure that people are going to actually use it. So the investment is, is paramount. You brought up another point about silos, and this is kind of a callback to something we talked about earlier, which is this overlap between marketing and information technology, and this overlap between marketing and sales. Where do you think the delineation is, or do you think that we're approaching a point, as I do, 
which silos are no longer relevant. And instead, what we're looking at, maybe not a holacracy like they tried at Zappos and some of these other companies, but I'm not saying you know totally structuralist. What I am saying is I think there's entirely too many overlaps anymore for these singular functional teams as opposed to sort of multi-matrix style organizations or honeycombs or anything like that in which you have a little bit more of an overlap between different departments. So marketing decisions, especially marketing technology decisions, aren't necessarily a marketing only decision yeah. or information technology yeah. decision, but instead they are a group decision made by a series of stakeholders that know what their teams are going to need and how they're going to use it. Yeah. So where does the line end or are we moving into this place where we're dissolving those barriers? That is a really, really good question. I, I, and I think it depends on the size of your company. I think I really don't. I mean, so if you look at, if you take DuPont, for example, for example. Not a standard example for many of our watchers, obviously. <laughs> right. but, but, I mean, but, but I mean, if you were to walk into DuPont and go, we're going to dissolve yeah. sales and marketing as two separate functions and IT as a separate function, they would just stare at you blankly and go, get out. You know it. what I mean? So, so I, I, but let me ask you this. Yeah. What if? What if, just throwing out, I know this is a total curveball for the idea, but let's say you come up with a new material, something that's not Kevlar, it's not uh, Tevex, Tyvek, Tyvek, whatever, there we go. Yeah, just, whatever, we'll call it uh, Jeffex. That's the new like material, it. and it's yeah. incredibly strong and super durable, and <laughs> it, is, it is obviously what Spider-Man suit is made out of. Uh -huh. But my point is, you come up with this new thing, and you decide, you know what, we've traditionally done it in this particular way. Right. What if with this one product, we try it differently for a minute? Yeah. What if we say for this particular team, we're gonna we're gonna create a team that the goal is to disrupt ourselves. The yep. goal is to try something different and try to create a modern marketing organization. If right. it fails, it fails. But if it succeeds, it's the blueprint for what we can do and what we can learn about how to make our teams move faster yep. in the 21st century. Right. In 2015, a marketing team that looks like the same one in 1950 is not going to work out so well. Very true. And it's not to say you know I'm not saying Dupont looks like 1950. Obviously, you have a digital marketer like yourself, but. The, the more rigid look at things, could they do something like that? Could big companies try things like that where they have these little skunk work groups to try to disrupt the status quo within? I think you can, I, and we're doing it in a way. I don't think we've taken it completely to the extent where there, there's no delineation, there's no lines, but I think we actually, we really have bridged a lot of those stereotypical gaps between marketing and sales where sales is consistently complaining that marketing isn't giving them the right leads or giving yeah. them the, the content that they need to actually sell, and marketing isn't pissed off at sales with like, they're doing nothing with our leads. We keep yep. giving them a massive amount of volume of leads. And I think what, what has helped us, and then I'll, I'll get back to it, but what has helped us is to be effective at marketing automation. It is contingent upon very clear and structured service level agreements. And what that does is it brings marketing and sales together where they have to get in the same room. Yep. And they have to really get aligned and agree on what does an actual lead look like? What do we call a marketing qualified lead? When does sales actually accept this lead? Yeah. Um, and then what's the process if sales gets a lead and it's not quite right, it still needs to be nurtured a bit more? What's that process where it comes back? I think that's actually where more marketing automation, even with just the process it requires you to go through, does a lot of that work in breaking down barriers because you can't be successful without bringing in people you may not have initially talked to in day-to-day -day marketing activities. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. And it's funny, the thing that kind of keeps coming up for me is, um, you know, I think you happen to be very lucky to be in the position you are working with DuPont and having access to the things that you do. And generally what my mind goes back to is that something like 80% of all businesses in this country are small businesses. And then you look at, you know, there's probably another, within that 20%, I'd say probably a, a, a larger majority than half are medium-sized yes, businesses. Absolutely. And when you think about the technology that they have access and budget to actually put in place, yes. that's step one. Step two, to actually configure and make work with other different solutions as opposed to what the enterprise has access to. Right. I think that might be the next frontier of what we're seeing in the in the challenges for modern marketers. Because I, you know, I look at the idea of a medium-sized business, a five, six, seven million dollar business. Yep. Uh, I guess you might even call them a small business center, it depends. But, so you have marketers that are bringing leads to the salespeople, but what if those two systems aren't talking? So the marketers then are slowed down in their ability to get the leads to the salespeople in time, and then the salespeople aren't using their CRM system or don't have the right CRM system right. to have the right data about right. 
previous buying the habits or uh, interests or right. different things like that. I think that's one of the big challenges for the modern marketer, especially in small and medium-sized businesses. Yeah, so I, we have a, a question real quick I want to touch on. Yeah. Does a company need to embrace modern digital marketing to be successful, i.e. get rid of the old ways? I, I mean, I guess I would say, just to start it off, I don't think you have to get rid of the old ways. No. I think you need to rethink things to make sure you're taking account for how your customers actually behave now. What? So that's it, right? And it goes back to establishing what is the outcome. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we have found that's very interesting um, in one of our businesses is that because all of a sudden digital marketing has proliferated and grown so massively so quickly, and you know, email marketing sometimes can be, depending on how you do it, a bit spammy, or you get lost in a hundred other emails that a person's getting a day, we've actually found that direct mail in very small, yeah. targeted areas is the more effective way to do it, right? Yeah. So I would say this. It's not about now we have to completely shift to solely 100% digital marketing. That is why knowing your customer, knowing their profile, knowing their challenges, and knowing where they go to get information is so important. Yep. Because if research, they're, if they're strategy, not, if they're not going onto Twitter, then don't spend a lot of your time yep. there. Just don't do it. And I think that's the thing. Is like you get. I think people get enamored with the new shiny object, or here's this new technology that's digital and automated, and it's gonna, it can make things so much easier, and then you realize, my customer isn't there. Yeah. So, I would say, you need to be up to speed and what's going on, because you don't, it's, it moves so fast and it's so overwhelming that you don't wanna fall behind, but it doesn't mean you have to scramble to always implement it if that's not where your customer is. Yeah, I, I would say to, the way that I would phrase it is that, it's not that, so it, there was a time where this was the marketing universe, right? It was this tiny little uh, thing, and the landscape has grown, but that doesn't mean your customers have migrated. So if your customers are still in the same place that they were, you don't have to go and chase the new shiny. If yep. they're not on Facebook, don't use Facebook. Yep. If, you know, for example, if your customers are you know, 65 to 80, you're gonna have a yeah. much better chance of reaching them with direct mail yeah. or phone Instagram's call. Instagram's not they, yeah, place. They're not on Snapchat. Sorry, they're <laughs> really not feeling it. Yeah. So you definitely need to you know, think of those things. But uh, I wanna make sure that we don't get stuck too much on this and we'll sure. come back to it. But Absolutely. I wanna uh, break right now and just give a quick shout out to our sponsors. Absolutely. So the Gaslight, uh, this is our sixth episode and the Gaslight has taken us on and they have become our headline sponsor. They have graciously provided us with uh, food and drinks so that we can keep coming here and keep making these episodes here uh, without it costing us a tremendous amount of money so we can keep having these episodes and having these great conversations. So just want to give them a shout out for having us. I want to mention a couple things to them. We've got this beautiful burger here, which many of you have probably been looking at and wondering why the hell we're not eating it. It's salivating. It's because we're talking about modern marketing. Uh, but we also want to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are going on here at the Gaslight. Uh, these are all things you should probably check out. One family barbecue special every Thursday from 5 to 11. Pulled pork, five sides, and a whole bunch of beer for like 25 bucks a person. It is kick-ass. We love, the reason that we started doing our show here is a bunch of reasons. One, they're close. Two, their old fashions are kick-ass. Three, the chip and nuggets are amazing. Four, the rest of their food's really good. Five, the staff is incredible. Just check it out. The, the Gaslight's a really cool spot. We really love that they've been a sponsor of ours and that they've allowed us to have this show here. Uh, they set us up in this nifty little corner, as you've seen. The episodes are more consistent now in, in our angles and all that sort of stuff, so we really just want to, again, appreciate everything that they're doing for us to let us have this show here. Um, the burger that we're about to eat has actually been featured in Philly Mag and Huffington Post, so we're going to cut it, and in between Matt and I talking, we're probably going to eat some of this here <laughs> burger. So, um, yeah, I'll get up in that. So, topic two. Don't mean to wave my knife at you, but uh, topic two is something that we've touched on a little bit so far, but I'm really glad to have Matt here to talk about it. Of all of the people in my network, Matt is among one of the best to talk about this, which is, I'm getting a look from my producer that I have not included her in Burgerland. <laughs> so, uh, please forgive me for my distraction for the moment, but... Uh, I got, I got to make sure that we are taking care of Alyssa. Take care of the important people. Got to take care of Alyssa. Yeah. Do that. Get that burger. Um, <laughs> where was I? Marketing automation. <laughs> so some of you are probably thinking, what the hell is marketing automation? You may have no idea what it means. Like you think you do because you hear, well, it's automating your marketing. Yeah, great. But there's Trinidad says hello. Trinidad, what's up? I've never been, but I'd love to. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> marketing automation. Some of you may be thinking that it's just automating your marketing. And yeah, you could do that. You know, one example would be the automated Twitter direct message. That's marketing automation, right? It's terrible. Don't do that. It's stupid. Nobody likes it. Nobody likes it. So don't do it. Um, but when we're talking about marketing automation in this context, I want to talk about a very specific type of marketing automation. That's the one that is being offered by companies like Marketo, Eloqua, uh, Pardo, or is it Pardot? I don't know. The one that Salesforce purchased. Um, and then, then there's a bunch of others. There's some really, there's some smaller players in the space. But it's this idea that people come to your website, they browse around, they look at different things, maybe they download a white paper, and then they take different actions on your site, and you want to make sure that you're understanding whether or not this person is going to become a lead, whether they're looking for a job, what they're doing. And there's a whole system that's integrated with your analytics that tracks this person as they move through the site and allows you to take smarter uh, decisions about what you send them and why. So, Matt, yeah. do us a favor and just give us a little intro. I'm making you go first also because so I'm going to eat some of this burger. <laughs> uh, but I want you, also you have more experience with it. You know, yeah. we really on the strategic side, we're on the strategic side of saying like, here's what you should be sending to this type of customer. If they right. visit this page, send them this, et cetera. Right. But you're working with it hands on, not just in the strategy, but also in the implementation. Yes. Tell us about what you're doing with Eloqua to the best of your ability in terms of not breaking any rules or anything like yes. that. But tell people what you're doing to make use of a tool like this and, and how it works. Sure. Well, let me tell you, the. I think where I would like to start is, let me tell you the, the problem that we solve, right? And then... And yes, then, this is a great book. Dude, I'm so distracted right now. I'm so sorry, but please think, but you can speak for like a few minutes when I'm done with or this. No, I, I'll like carry it for a minute. This I, like, really good I like this deal, at least. Okay. Right. So the, the issue that we were seeing was getting people in, into the top, you think of a sales funnel, right? Mm -hmm. Getting people in the top of the funnel, not really an issue. I think a lot of people know different tools and tactics in the way to get people to be aware of your brand, get people onto your website, to start poking around, that sort of thing, right? And then, Very light commitment sort of behavior. Absolutely. I'll check out a website, yeah. I'll click on this post. Call to action, you know, it doesn't take too much to get someone to, to click through and, and, and start poking around a little bit. Well, so they speak. Then there's the very bottom of the funnel, and that's the more hands-on, right? That's where your sales team comes in most of the time. Yep. And, you know, okay, that's taken care of, not a problem. Well, a lot of companies have an issue with that, but yeah. you, you know what to do there. I think if you talk to a ton of companies, it's that in-between area. They have no idea what to do. Mm -hmm. No clue what to do. It's that nurturing phase yep. where they've been on your website, but maybe haven't displayed a lot of buying signals, haven't filled out a contact us form, haven't reached out in any sort of way. What do you do? And if you, that, in addition to the fact that I, from our research, I think something like 65% of people, um, you know, are researching on their own and are doing their own sort of work to educate themselves without ever reaching out. Yep. So what marketing automation is to me, is it is a way to bridge that gap. It's to how do you continuously nurture someone down that funnel? Um, and then be, you talked about data and analytics and be able to see what they do. We call it digital body language. Yep. Looking at someone's digital body language, depending on how many sites they visited, what sites did they visit, what white papers did they download, um, what emails did they open or interact with, you are then to you are then able to customize a very personal experience for the type of content that they're seeing. So it's almost counterintuitive. Yes, it's automated and almost you could say ro robotic. Yep. But you're actually in that process creating a very personalized experience. And I think that's why I get really excited about working on marketing automation because I think people feel like it's a much more personalized and closer touch. So I'm gonna to touch on that for a minute. I'll let you take a couple bites of like in the it. meantime. But so to Matt's point, to your, to your point about it's a much more you hear marketing automation, you think, oh, hands off, right? I right. have to do anything with right. it. So you think that it's a much less personal experience, but it winds up being a much more personal experience. But why is that? And I'll tell you what I've found in my experience. The reason why it's a more personal experience is because of the overwhelming amount of work that has to go into before even launching a marketing automation system. To do all of the thinking that goes into all of the different places they might visit on your site and what that means and what they might want and understanding the buying behavior and the various different um, 
you know, signals how to interpret what that means for the person that's on your website. Right. So if you don't do that work, I mean, it, let's not have any misconceptions here. You cannot buy Marketo, that's right. do a three-click install, and expect that you're going to sell more. You're not. It's just a tool, just like Facebook's a tool, just like a hammer is a tool. It is not going to build you a house if you buy it. Same way, Marketo, Eloqua, any of these, there needs to be a deep understanding of who your customer is, what they're interested in, what their buying behaviors are going to be, and then that's going to give you some indication about whether or not you can even move them yes. through the middle of the funnel. Yeah. So we got a couple of questions that came in. Um, the, the first question is, is marketing automation more personal? Yeah. Uh, I, I would say yes and no. Right. I would say if done well, it can assist in it being more personal because it can move people from the experiences that you don't need to be personal that you can automate yeah. and make the ones that where you do need it to be personal more personal because you can spend more time on not answering the questions that could have been automated. Yeah. So that's what I would suggest for that question. Well, and it, it's true when you said if done well. Yes. I mean, you can use a marketing automation platform and just do batch and blast like you were before. Yep. Right. You just paid a lot of money. A lot of money sometimes. A lot of money. Depending on the system. To do something that is no more effective than what you were already doing. Yep. Or, and this is where it comes with knowing your customer and being able to segment your customer. And that's that's where we start with each of our businesses. Is if you are not completely 100% certain of your customer profile and what are the ins and outs of that customer, how does that, then even within that specific market, what are the six or seven different personas that are within that market, right? And what's unique about them? What's niche about them? If you don't do that work, then it's, it's actually a useless endeavor. Yeah. But if you do, all of a sudden, you are talking to all these different people at the same time, pulling in different content that you have tagged specifically for a certain type of customer demographic. And that's where it becomes a lot easier to talk to a much wider audience that is segmented more so than you have ever seen before. So yes, if done well. If it done is right, much if you more put personal. the work in on it. And to be that personal, you have to go and do deep, deep research. Yes, you have to absolutely. really deeply understand things. So I would, yeah, I would agree with everything you just said. The, the other question we got was, how do you convert a lurker into a subscriber? <laughs> Which is a really interesting question because it's not so much marketing automation, it's yeah. partly marketing yeah. automation, but I think that comes down to a lot of A-B testing. It comes down to your use of calls to action. It comes down to uh, you know general user behavior and testing. Right. So you know uh, if you look at a site like socialtriggers.com, uh, uh, it's gone through a number of different changes, and, I, and I'm not sure how well it's converting now, but the original uh, thesis-themed uh, social triggers had calls to action everywhere. Like subscribe opt-ins were everywhere. Top of the screen, it had uh, a header, it had one on the right side, it had one after every post, it had one everywhere. And his opt-in rate was super high. Yeah. It wasn't just super high because where he put it, it was also super high about how he got people to the site, the type of campaigns he ran, the type of headlines he was using his blog posts, the A-B testing he was doing, where he put the subscribes. So I think turning a lurker into a subscriber comes down to were you valuable enough to keep them coming back in the first place? And the second thing is, did you make them a compelling enough offer to get them to subscribe? Absolutely. Did you get them to come? So we have uh, on our website, on the homepage, we just had learn more about social media, subscribe to our newsletter. Yeah. And that was good, and it worked okay. And then we uh, created a white paper called the Complete and Essential Social Media Strategy Framework. And since we put that up, we've seen our subscriptions go way up. Yes. Um, and that's because we provided a more compelling offer. Yes. So I would suggest that it, it comes down to A-B testing, trying different things out, incentivizing, and making sure that you're hooked on value. I, I, we focus on value a ton. Um, you are competing for mind share. Yep. Every, I mean, and it's, it's gotten, again, the word overwhelming, right? There's so many different things, messages calling for your attention. So I think our number one priority has always been what is that one piece of content? And we'll we'll kind of we'll kind of put our eggs in a little bit of a basket, like all our eggs in a little bit of a basket and try to develop that really kick butt piece of content that is so valuable and so instrumental to them doing their job that they have to subscribe. The, the one phrase I say quite often to our, a lot of our marketing and communications people is, we are here to make them rock stars at their jobs. So if you come from the mentality that you are creating content that is then going to make someone a rock star at the job they're currently doing, 
I'll put my email address in for that. Yep. Yo, you're gonna make me a rock star. You're gonna make me look good for my boss. You're gonna make me have the ability to drive revenue for my company. Absolutely, I'll subscribe. So I would say maybe have that in the back of your head. How do I make people rock stars at what they're doing? You know, I think. That, that is an amazing point, and what it leads me to think about is that I'm sure you guys didn't come up with that arbitrarily. You know, I mean, obviously everybody wants to be a rock star in their job, yeah, yeah, but yeah. because you are dealing in a business-to-business -business environment, and people are making very big buying decisions, like they're not just buying like $15 worth of Kevlar from you. No. So, <clears throat> as a result, to, to make somebody feel good about that decision and empower them to become rock stars in their, in their job is to deeply know your customer. Yes. And if you are using marketing automation as a retail store, you're probably not trying to make somebody look like a rock star for making that decision to buy a coat or a dress or something like that, but you are trying to figure out some way to make them feel good about whatever the decision is that they're made. Yep. So I would say, and how do you get somebody to a lurker to a subscriber? I think it's a matter of understanding what it is that would compel them to go from a lurker Absolutely. to a subscriber. Like, what is that? What is their hurdle? If you can ask yourself this, why aren't they a subscriber? Yeah. Why are they a lurker and not a subscriber? What's missing between point A and point B? And that would generally be, I think, a good starting point. Yeah. In B2B, it's look like a rock star. In B2C, it's feel like a rock star. Yeah, that's I think, that's, I think you know, in general, those are two kind of yeah. mindsets to come from. So, but yes, I, th I think that's absolutely spot on. I would completely agree with that. So, in the world of marketing automation, we're, we're typically t talking about email. We're talking about these situations where people pop onto different parts of a website, and based upon them having already put in a contact information and cooking them and finding and tracking them all right, over. Right. That's general. So, one, there's obviously people who will take issue with the privacy yes. concerns of that there's situation, abuse of that, absolutely. which there's definitely abuse of. But I don't want to touch on that today because I think that that's a conversation for another day. I want to talk about the future of marketing automation. Yeah. So one, do you see this becoming something that grows easier and easier for companies? Is there going to be a data bank of different best practices that companies can pull from and email templates and things right. and different um, waterfall campaigns? And I think more importantly or equally importantly, are we going to start to see them become either socially integrated or are we going to start to see social marketing automation uh, in a way that doesn't suck like uh, auto direct <laughs> messages and yeah. you know just yeah. basically social media spam. Right. So we'll, we'll take that in two parts. Uh, your first part about is it going to become easier as it goes on? Yes and no. Because whenever something becomes easier, there is, in my opinion, another problem that arises somewhere else. Yep. So here's where it'll become easier. As more and more people do this, and the, and, the, and the longer time goes on, obviously you would hope that we get better at it. Yeah. Right. And we're we're much better at having the right message to the right person at the, at the right time, right? Because that's what all, that's what marketing automation is all about. Yep. Right message, right person, right time. Yep. So once you figure that out, wonderful. That's step one. Where I have seen and where we struggle is marketing automation also allows you to do a ton of tracking and a lot of data collection. And I think where a lot of companies are falling short now is we're so busy running around to, to tackle the next thing, we're already overloaded. There is a massive amount of data, massive amount of data and analytics that never gets combed through. Got it. There are insights out there that unless you are structured properly, people never even look through. I think there's a ton, there's a ton of meat left on the bone, um, especially now in marketing automation. One of the, I was out at a conference on the West Coast this past year, and the one position and role I heard people needing over and over and over again. Data analyst? Data analyst. They called it data scientist, yeah. but same same thing. Yeah. Data analyst. But yet that is missing from the repertoire of a lot of, of marketing oh, teams. Absolutely. I, so I taught a social media strategy course at Drexel University. And a lot I had a probably a class of about twenty different kids and they asked me, you know, I'm looking for a career in social media, what do you think I should do? I was right. like, well, do you want to have fun or do you want to make money? <laughs> and they were like, it's a big it, difference. It's a big difference. It, you want to have fun? Be a community manager. Go yeah. for it. You'll make anywhere between forty-five and like eighty thousand in a good company Absolutely. to run social media channels and and populate it with content, carry content. Great. Yeah. You want to make money? Data. You want to make money? Learn how to use Excel and and yes. um, what's that statistics program that we both used? Oh, uh, so there's mini tabs. Mini tabs. Yeah. So yeah, so, well. yeah, become a statistician. Yeah. Learn how to crunch the numbers yeah. and develop insights. If you can find insights in social listening data oh and analytics data and marketing uh, automation data and email there's data, no. you're, you'll be a freaking rock star. Right. I mean, I don't want to be. I don't want to use like just buzzwords, but 
big data is here yep. and it is here to stay. And if I could do it all over again, I think being stronger in statistics, stronger in data analyzation, and then knowing how to very efficiently parse that out into actual insights, man, that's liberty. Yeah. Because every single company is hurting for that. Yeah. I don't care how successful you are, everyone's looking to do that more. Yeah. And so if you can come in and provide that value, uh, you won't be hurting for Absolutely, a job. Well, and, and just to just to make the numbers real, uh, I recently, we, we've been talking with a prospect, I won't name their name or anything, and they gave us a whole bunch of numbers that they were working with. And they said, we'd like you to look at these numbers, and before we do work with you, we'd like you to justify the cost of doing work with you. Right. We'd like you to look at it and, and justify the cost of doing work with you. So I looked at the numbers and I began to run it, and what I looked at was they had a certain click-through rate. What I saw was a 1% increase in their click-through rate. If we could just increase their click-through rate, and we're talking hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of impressions, yeah. If we could increase their click-through rate by a half a percentage, we're talking about $200,000 wow. in, in, in recaptured revenue. Yes, absolutely. It's unbelievable, unbelievable to think that that small little... So if you can find the insights in there, and, and we're talking a half a percent here. Yeah. If we were to do it by 2-3%, right. I mean, we are killing it for that. Yeah. So yeah, just to just to kind of get to that point. So that's the end of topic two. Well, officially the end in terms of timing. I want to make sure we're sticking strict to our timing. Our producer is really good at that for us. Uh, but uh, and and we have one more question which we'll get to in shots of social. So uh, I want to first give another shout out to our sponsor, the Gaslight. Gaslight is at uh, Market Street, right uh, east of Second Street, a little bit down from the Continental, right next to Drinkers. Fantastic place, burgers on point, foods on point, drinks are on point, services on point. We just want to thank them again for sponsoring the show, letting us have it here, giving us a little, a little space to have our chats. Um, so I just want to thank the Gaslight again for having us. Uh, one more thing I want to mention about them because we do have uh, uh, Pope Week is coming up next week. Yes. And we're actually not going to be doing an episode next week. I'm sorry. But uh, the Pope is going to be in town, and we just think it's going to be too difficult to get our guest here and make sure we have time. Yeah, yeah it's, it's going to be busy. But as a result of that, the Gaslight has uh, extended hours for the time that the Pope is going to be here. So I just want to read those off to you so you know that, that um, you can get here and you can eat. They're going to be doing breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. September 25th, Friday, they're going to be 11 a.m. to 2 a.m. Saturday, the 26th, 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. And then Sunday, they'll be open from 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. on Monday. So uh, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you to get in here. If you come in, please do us a favor. Mention that you heard it on the social happy hour. I'm sure that'll make them real happy about everything. Um, but definitely give the chicken nuggets a try. Try the old-fashioned. I'm a big fan. Uh, just great food overall. So now we're moving into sort of our closing wrap-up segment where we're just going to kind of, you know, kind of talk a little bit about the two different topics we talked about. But we're also doing our section that we call Shots of Social. And the way Shots of Social work is this. We want you to ask us any questions that you have. And if you happen to stump us, like to a point where we're just like, I don't know what you're talking about. We're going to take a round of shots. So uh, you don't have to pay for them. I'm going to pay for them. Actually, Gaslight's going to pay for them. But we will do shots if you can stump us. And if not, we're just going to we're just gonna keep talking. But if you have questions, we've got Alyssa, our producer. She's going to be writing down any questions you have. I've got one right now. Please send them in. If you love what we've done so far, please keep tapping on the screen, giving us the hearts, telling us you love us. Uh, but we're going to we're gonna keep rolling a little bit with the role of the modern marketer and marketing automation and, and all that sort of good stuff. So before we get back to our, yeah. our topics and kind of wrap up, uh, we have... How do you plan on timing with automation? Ooh. And I, I mean, so I'll, I'll answer it how I think it's asked, but then timing can make can take so many different forms yep. too within marketing automation. I mean, the biggest question that we often get, uh, especially with people within the business, is okay, so you've set up this campaign. It's got six to seven different emails. There's landing pages involved, depending on how they interact and what calls to action they click on. Certain events happen. Yep. Over what sort of time period should that happen? So I think that's kind of one what week, that, six weeks, one, two weeks. Six, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's so what I, I think. That's what if it's that's not up. what you meant, let us know. But yeah. we're assuming what it means is how do you determine the timing for your marketing automation? Yeah. Somebody does something, should it be? Should it happen immediately? Should it happen right. in three days, in ten days, in sixty-five days? So I'll let you start with it. And I've got some thoughts. To yeah, yeah. So I, there are general best practices, right? That we we try to follow in the very beginning. So I think if you can. And one of the things that's really nice is that there's a wealth of information online that you can research regarding like, okay, I've set up a six or seven different email campaign. How should I stagger them? What should that look like? 
So there are best practices of which you can start at. And so we typically don't like to bombard our customers or people who we would like to be customers. Fair. So we will do a little bit of a drip marketing over time. Maybe they're getting an email a week. Maybe it's two weeks, depending on how we've talked to them previously. Let me ask you something before yep. you continue. Sure. Is any of that based upon what the typical buying cycle is? So yes. I, I would assume, Absolutely. so like, let's say you're buying a, a million dollar server farm or something like that. Right. That's gonna be a lot different than if like you're buying socks. You know, at, at no a certain question. point, I'm just gonna buy my socks. Yeah. So if, if you wait 30 days, I've probably, probably already bought my socks. But no, if, a, if it's a major point. investment that has a lot of buy-in, you need to get a lot of people that are, that are in on the decision, I yep. imagine you can space it out a little bit further. So for example, this is the one segment that I was actually uh, on a conference call about today, their buying cycle is two years. Not a short window yeah. of time. So and you're hitting them hit, in the week is we're not hitting them every week, right? right? So I think that's actually a very valid point. The other thing I would say is there is trial and error, and I, I would encourage people to experiment. Like it's one of those things where you can't be afraid to try. Yep. You do your best, the best you can. But what's great about this is it collects data. That's where you mentioned A/B testing. Yep. We A/B test everything: yep. subject lines, copy, form design, um, email send times, either day or how long and short we wait in between it. So we're measuring all those different things and looking at our outcomes and our click-through rates and open rates and that sort of thing and then tweaking based on that. So what's also kind of cool is once you set something up in marketing automation, it's not static. Yep. You can dynamically change. I have, I can't tell you how many times I've paused a campaign and said, well, that obviously wasn't working. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go ahead and spread this out just a little bit more. You could tell that people were maybe a little bit annoyed. We got a couple unsubscribes that we really didn't want. Okay, so then we'll, so I think to answer that question appropriately is you have to look at the data. And I know that that may sound like a cop out, but yeah. that's what we do. Yeah, we don't make any decision without first consulting, okay, given the data we've collected, what is the most appropriate time? So let's make that real practical for yeah. people. I'm gonna try and break that down. And you can jump in at sure. any point or you can just correct me at the end, but just to make it real practical for everyone about timing. Let's say that you have an email list of a thousand people. Let's say that that's what you have. And you're sending a really important email campaign. So I would suggest that the first thing you do is probably peel off 50 people from it and you A-B test the subject line for 25 of them. Yep. And you basically do that, uh, you send your email campaign maybe at 8 a.m., something yep. like that. And, uh, and and you send that out, let's say that's the time that you send it. Send them both at a.m., see which one gets a higher open and click-through rate, whichever you're going for, whether right. it's open or click-through. Right. So let's say you find that, that subject line B gets the higher click-through. Then what you do is I would peel off another 50 people, use that same headline the next day, and send out the email with the same headline and then two different colored buttons and maybe different layouts. Yes. So you gotta change one variable at a time because if you change too many, you don't know which is working. You gotta control. So you gotta control. So you gotta, it depends on how many campaigns you have time for and obviously you wanna make sure that you're, you're controlling the variables as much as possible. But let's say you have a period of time where you can try this out. You got a thousand people on your list. You take 300 of them to keep doing A-B tests for, and what you do is the first one you try one variable, then you do another variable, then you do another variable, and you find the best combination of things, the best headline, the best layout, and say the best time of day to send it. Then what you do is you take the rest of your email list and use that. From that point forward, you know you've got, ostensibly, the best coll collection of different variables in one place. That's a way that I think you can go about A-B testing and picking things. Now, as far as timing goes, it's the same thing. Um, Let's say that you work for a credit card company and you're trying to get people to sign up. You may know that it's the, the distance in between when you sent them. You may know it's the discount that you offer them. Maybe you give them an APR of 25% to start and then you drop it down to 20 and then 18. But you may also want to try doing 22 and then 20 because you may get an extra 2% in terms of the APR you can get people to sign up without any major loss in conversions. So really, unfortunately, you do have to do the data testing to find out what's going to work best. And again, sorry for medium and small businesses, this is going to be very labor intensive for you and oftentimes out of your skill set. So you may need to bring somebody else on, but in the end, that may be worth your time and effort and money. So a couple points on that, if we've got a second. Yeah. One mindset to come 
from when you're, when you're approaching marketing automation is the 80-20 rule. Yeah. 80% of your work is going to be upfront. I mean, it's just kind of the reality of the situation where, Come on, our where, quote. where 80 percent of the work is going to be in, okay, I need four different versions of this email. Yep. I need four different versions of the subject line. I need four different colors for the call to action, that sort of thing. So one recommendation I can give people who if you're sitting there thinking, small, medium business, how do I do this? I can't do this. Yeah. We utilize templates. Yep. So we will we will actually spend a lot of time creating templates so that changing something is actually not very labor intensive drop, because you it's drop. more of yep. a cut and paste or a drop. Yep. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that. We um, you know we would love to do more A B testing with a lot of our clients, but we work with small and medium sized yeah. businesses and sometimes there's just not time to do more than one or two A B tests. So um, timing, how are we? Seven twenty five. Ah, so we're running up against our time. Gotcha. I can talk to you for hours, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Totally talk to you for hours. Um, all right, so we're going to wrap this up here. Um, we obviously can talk about this for hours. Uh, when uh, You can reach out to either of us. Um, I'm Jeff on Twitter. I'm Jay Gibbard. Uh, Matt is Mengler86, M-E-N-G-L-E-R 86. You can reach out to both of us. If you go onto my Twitter account, Jay Gibbard, you'll see basically everything you need to see. Um, I want to thank the Gaslight again for having us as our sponsor. I want to thank my amazing producer, Alyssa, who, as always, keeps us on track, keeps us on point, keeps everything flowing in the right direction. I want to thank Matt Engler for coming out. and Engler with an E. With an E. Yep, yes. M-E-N-G-L-E-R 86. Yep. Um, I want to thank Matt for coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, great conversation. I think a lot that people should be able to take away from this. If you're watching this on replay, uh, be sure to send us a tweet. Either of us, both of us, and let us know if you enjoyed it. Uh, those of you that are still watching, hopefully, uh, please give us a bunch of hearts. Let us know that you love the show. And I hope that you tune in, not next week, but the following week after the Pope has left town. Uh, we'll be back with uh, a lot more Social Happy Hour. We'll be back here at the Gaslight. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Love you guys. Mwah! See you next time. See you next Tuesday.